to hear from you, to hear of your word. Your word's a lamp to our feet, it's a light to our pathway. We thank you for your word. We won't just be hearers only, but we will be doers of your holy word. And we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Will you be seated this morning? Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's good to have Noel home today. And uh, we thank God that she's doing well in Bible school. So if uh, you hadn't been able to talk to her, make sure you're able to talk to her and hear some cool things that she's been doing. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's exciting to be in Bible school. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I'm excited about it. Aren't you excited for her? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles this morning or device over to Acts 13. I'm sorry, uh, Acts chapter 11. And then also, we want to look at Acts chapter 16. We want to look at Acts 11. And we also want to look at Acts chapter 16. And we'll look at Acts 11 first. We started a series last week called The Home Field Advantage. The Home Field Advantage. We said this, your home is home field. And there should be an advantage to your home. An advantage from living in your house. An advantage to even coming back to your house. Your house should be an advantage to you, and your house should be an advantage to your kids. Your home should be an advantage to your grandkids, Amen. to other family members, to friends. Amen. It's a home field advantage. Acts 11, verse 13, it says, And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house. Now this is uh, them, this is Peter talking about the story of Cornelius. He's been to Cornelius' house. He's entered the house of a Gentile. Because God told him to. God showed him in, a, in, a, in a, a, a trance that he was supposed to go. And spoke to him about the trance that he was supposed to go. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send him to Joppa and call for Simon, surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and as upon us at the beginning. There was a home field advantage. Cornelius had gathered his family. Cornelius had gathered his friends. Don't you know, when the Holy Spirit was first poured out on the Gentiles, which is what happened here, there was a home field advantage. There was an advantage to be related to Cornelius in this moment. There was an advantage that other people did not get at that time. Right away, there was an advantage to being in the family of Cornelius. There was an advantage of being his friend. Because if you were, you were in that house. Amen. And it says here, which you and all your household will be saved. God's interested, very interested, in fact, maybe even more interested than you are, that all your household is saved. Amen. Amen. Some of your household may not be in church this morning. They may be lost, or they, they, uh, they may be a prodigal out wandering in the world. God is interested in them coming home. God's interested in them being able to sit beside you in church, hallelujah, Amen. and work alone beside you in church, glory to God. If you, if, if you have some household that's maybe may no longer part of your household, and they're fluttering about in the world this morning, you take the scripture and you say, God, just as you're interested in their household, you are interested in my household, and I claim, and you name that son or you name that daughter, I claim them for the house of God because they are part of my household. Amen. Amen. Now, look at chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 30. It says that he brought them out and said, Sirs, now this is the daily. And it's speaking of Paul and Silas after the earthquake and, and the doors were open, the shackles came off. And, and uh, the jailer was about to commit suicide, fearing what would happen 
with this huge jailbreak. And Paul said, now what's out here? We'll stare here. But verse 30. And he brought them out, this is the jailer, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Hallelujah. Is God interested in your household being saved? Amen. Oh yeah, he's interested in your household being saved. There should be a home filled advantage. If you are a relative, a son, a daughter, if you're a relative of this jailer, especially if you lived in his home, there was an advantage that day. How many of you know that? There was an advantage. What was the advantage? The man of God was coming to the home. The man of God was going to preach the gospel. Faith was going to be built up on the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody in that house was about to get saved. Everybody in that house was about to pass from darkness into the light. Glory to God. There's a home field advantage. Your home today should have an advantage spiritually. Amen. And we spoke last week about the advantage of prayer. There should be a prayer advantage in your home. So, well, you know, I just, I don't want to pray out loud. But you need to pray about that. And you need to get over that. Amen. Because your kids need to hear you pray out loud. Amen. Amen. They need to do that. Because you can't just go by, well, I told them they need to pray. Uh -uh. Lots of parents use this last week because um, if I were to ask for a show of hands, more than half of this congregation at some time in your life had uh, a tobacco addiction. And so a lot of people can relate to this. You know, and if you didn't, your parent did. You know, and, and so uh, a lot of people can relate to this, or you know somebody, or you've got some family members that they have strong tobacco addiction, but yet they tell their kids, you smoke and I'll kill you. <laughs> I've heard some family members say that. <laughs> you smoke and I'll kill you. But, you know, they're just going at it. Well, guess what? More than likely they're going to smoke. More not good they are. You know, maybe a man with a big old baseball dip. I, I want you to start dipping. Don't you ever dip. Well, guess what? Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> you can say, don't you ever dip all day until you're blue in the face. But as soon as they get their hand on a can, they're going to shove it in their lip. Yes. Mm -hmm. Huh? There's, he, the Bible teaches... Now, you don't just teach a precept. By precept's important. What's by precept? That's the words coming out of your mouth. But you also teach by example. Now, I just use tobacco because I don't want to see your hand. But lots of you can relate to that. I can relate to that. Lots of us can relate to that. because, And if you never did have to get over that, you never did have to leave God for deliverance from that, then that's your testimony. <laughs> But if you did have to leave God for deliverance from that, then that's your testimony. But a lot of us can relate to that. Or we have friends that have happened, you know, because of the example. There has to be an example of prayer. You can't Amen. just tell your kids you need to pray. Amen. The disciples were around Jesus all the time. What they say, Lord, teach us to pray. What they want, they want an example. So that should be a home field advantage. And then we talked about, I'm just catching some of you up, and we talked about the prayer of agreement. Mm -hmm. Man, one of the best deals to do in a house, the prayer of agreement. Because yeah. your kids, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately for some of you, and fortunately for others, your kids are going to leave one day. <laughs> I don't know what side of the fence they're on. <laughs> Some of you may be, bring it on, glory to God. Let's get them gone. Let's get them gone. Let's get them gone. It's half of them. Half of them need to go. The other half gets no, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Some of you, you, you know, I, I only got one left. And, I, and we're, we're not going to have any more. There'll be, there'll be no immaculate conception. We're not going to have any more, glory to God. But, but you know, so on that one, I'm kind of like, uh, time, slow down. Time, slow down. Slow yourself down. Slow down. But yet the Bible says that time is going to increase, doesn't it? Time's going to get faster. So I don't know what side of that you're on. 
But they're going to leave one day, right? Right. They're going to leave. But if, if that, that, that home field advantage of prayer is in place, they're going to still be, they're going to feel real comfortable to call back home. Yeah. Mom or dad, hey, will you agree with me in prayer? Yes. Will you pray about this? That's, that's called the home field advantage. Oh, that's it. And if you don't have that in your home, decide today, I'm going to have the home field advantage. There's going to be an advantage to my house. There's going to be an advantage of prayer in my home. And so today, though, I want to talk about another home field advantage. And that's the Word of God. Amen. Should be a home field advantage. Man, my, my parents, uh, uh, I would never say that they were perfect. I would never say that everything my parents did was right. But one thing my parents did, and I meant to bring one of the volumes up here today, is we had some Bible story books. And I think they went through volume 12. It was from Genesis to Revelation. Had some pictures, had more words than pictures, but they had a little picture you could look at while they were reading the words. But every single night, I heard a story out of one of those Bible story books. Every single night. And you know, sometimes I'd be in Sunday school. Y'all remember Sunday school? <laughs> Everybody, we used to, we used to, you know, that was big. It's not as big, especially not denominational churches, but it used to be really big. In fact, at one point in time, more people would be in Sunday school than were at church. Did you know that? Yes. Sunday school attendance would be, you know, up. And church attendance would be this. Some people go to Sunday school and they go home. <laughs> or wherever they went, I don't know. They may go to Sunday school and go to another church. I don't know. But so Sunday school was big. And you had it like for every grade. Every grade had a class, you know. And, and uh, it was so fun growing up because you even had, like, promotion. You know, you had promotion Sunday to get to go to the next grade. You know, and it was really fun until you met the teacher the next grade. You're like, I want to go back now. No. <laughs> no, the teachers were awesome. They were wonderful. But because of that home field advantage, sometimes I would help them teach, you know. You know, because it was every grade, so it would be a kind of a small class. You know, sometimes only two or three students in it because every grade. And so sometimes, you know, it'd be somebody, the teacher, they, they may not have even been saved very long. And so they're reading this for the first time. And, and, and but because of that home field advantage, I could help them, you know. They, they, would, they would stumble on the word, and, and I would just be five or six years old, and I could help them with that word. I could tell them what, what, what that word, how to pronounce that word. Why? Because I had a home field advantage. They didn't have that home field advantage. But I had that. I was sitting in a barb shop in Belleville, Texas. It used to be called Avenue F. They renamed it. Jessica's not here. I'd ask her. But I think it's called uh, Veterans or something like that. Oh, yeah. There's an old Del Rio went back there, too. Uh, is that what it is? Veterans or something? I don't know. It used to be called Avenue F. And if you've ever been to Del Rio, you know, I know. I know that uh, you, you think in your mind avenues go from A through Z. But... And Del Rio, they're kind of mixed up. You know? <laughs> and so right in the middle of some letters was F. And, and it, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't between uh, E and G, but there wasn't Avenue F. You just had to know, you know. It, it was not outsider friendly. We, it was our town. We know. We know. We know. So on Avenue F, though, there was an old-fashioned barbershop. Any of y'all ever seen one of those? And you have, a, you have a little stripey thing moving on the outside, old-fashioned barbershop. And so my dad would take me to the old-fashioned barbershop. And it had the leather straps hanging off the chairs, you know, where they would sharpen up the straight razor, you know. We weren't as concerned about disease control and stuff like that. We, they just sharp. Yeah. You, everybody got the same razor. It was sharp. And uh, the air, the, you know, the atmosphere and the air, you, you, you could smell kind of a mixture of of cigarette smoke and tonic. It just kind of made, it kind of made a barbershop mixture. That's what it sounded like. And there were chairs. Chairs this way, chairs that. And these guys didn't make appointments. No. But there were chairs. And, and you know, if you went in on a weekend, this, all the chairs were full, and everybody had a newspaper. I don't know where they got the newspapers, but everybody had a piece of a newspaper as they sat in these chairs. And the two gentlemen that ran this barbershop, they had on the uh, Mexican soap operas. You know? And so that was all you had to watch. And for a little kid, that was not very interesting. You know, soap operas were not very interesting to me anyways, but a uh, soap opera in Spanish was even less interesting to me. 
and that's all it was. But, you know, I can remember, Jake, seven years old, telling these guys, and I don't even know, uh, uh, I think back, I don't know if they even spoke English or not, but I remember telling them the gospel story. I would tell these guys about how Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And I would tell these guys about how Jesus rose from the dead. And I would tell these guys about this. And I would sit, and they would put this little flat thing. You remember the flat thing? You put the flat thing on the seat, and then you're tall enough. And I was always a little height challenged anyways. And so <laughs> they put that, and I would sit on that and tell them about Jesus. I mean, they got me out of the seat really quick. I don't know if they, if they knew what I was talking about. But that's because of a home field advantage. That's why that is. That's a home field advantage. There was another barber shop that we'd go to occasionally. Not as much because it was a little more expensive. I think it was five dollars instead of two dollars. I don't know. Something like that. It was so cheap. But you know, I think it was two dollars. It was five dollars instead of two dollars. And every now and then, I think my dad liked the way they did his hair better at that one. So every now and then, we'd go to that one. And these guys, they would talk between them all the time. They were always talking to each other. I know you. You think people ought to talk to you, but these guys were always talking to each other. They would never talk to you. But they made the mistake while I was in their chair. They were talking about drinking and talking about getting drunk. I had a home field advantage. Do you think I say any of that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I told them God's not pleased with it. God doesn't want you to go out and get drunk. Man, the room got really, really quiet. Some of you may not want your kids to have that home field advantage. I don't know. But I tell you, I don't want them to have it. I do. I, I want mine to happen. I was, I was really heartbroken this last Wednesday. I was substituting in a middle school, not not the one that's uh, changing its name because of cancel culture, but the other one, one of the others. And I was substituting in this middle school. And as I was sitting there, and it was a hard day. I mean, I had some. Ooh, it was, I, I felt like a, a lion tamer in that class. But uh, this was the last one, and I already prayed. And, and this is my, I, I got to go home after this class, and I'd already prayed. I said, dear God, I, I just want to leave. God, just see me through this one so I can go. I just leave. I'd already sent three kids to a principal at some point in time. And, I, and, and the principal, I think, was more upset at me than at the kids. And uh, I was like, God, I need to go home. I substitute talk for 16 years. And I can count on one hand ever having a class like this one. It was that bad. Wow. It was that bad. And uh, anyways, this girl was talking to me, and I appreciated some good conversation. By this time, the end is near. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's about to be an earthquake. The cell doors are about to open. <laughs> I, ain't, I, I ain't waiting to get the jailer saved. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm gone. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, if God said so to get the jailer saved, I would. But I was ready to go. I was ready for the roll. But uh, anyways, she was talking to me, and she started telling me about her church. And, and, and it was a good conversation. And she said this, she said, my church, my church is, is a, a good family church. I was like, oh, that's good, that's good. And she said, we're, we're a non-denominational church. Oh, that's good, that's good. That sounds good. And, and she said, we're non-judgmental. I was like, ooh, that's good, that's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said this, we were the first church in San Angelo for my pastor to marry same sex. I, had, I didn't want to show on my face that my smile was... <laughs> I didn't want I, I was careful. I, I held my chin because I didn't want it to be on the floor. You know, I was like, let my chin fall. I'm hold it up. <laughs> Sometimes if you just keep your mouth shut, nobody will know that you've just been shocked beyond reason. Well, that's what she told me, and I, I was heartbroken. And she told me again how they're so non-judgmental. I, I, I wouldn't dare tell you what the name of the church is here in town, but it is a non-denominational church. Mm. And I said this, I said, well, um, I am so glad that it's non-judgmental. I said, because it's important not to judge, it's important not to, to gossip. But let me ask you this, let me ask you. If you saw someone that they, and, and, and they were doing something that did not please, did not please God. And we knew through his word that it didn't please him. Would you, in the most loving way possible, tell them what you're doing does not please God? So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you wouldn't consider that judging, would you? I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, so if you knew, 
by the word of God that something someone was doing was sin. Something someone was doing was hurting God. Something someone was doing was against God. You, you would, in the most loving way possible, you would let them know, hey, that's not right. You're not supposed to be doing this. I'm not judging you. I'm judging what you're doing. I just want you to know. And she said, no, that wouldn't be judging. I said, I don't think so either because, you know, after you've let them know, you know, isn't it up to them? They can decide after them, right? But at least they have the information. At least they know what to do with it. That's up to them. So that's not judging, is it? She said, no. And I said, no, of course you wouldn't go tell people what you saw them doing or what you know they're doing. You would go tell people, would you? And she said, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I said, good, because gossip is one of the seven things that God hates. So we wouldn't want to do that. She said, no, I wouldn't want to do that. But I was amazed that, that she did have the answer, that she didn't know. She just didn't know she knew. I didn't carry the conversation any further, but it was a real learning experience for me. The very same day, the very same day, I prayed with someone on the phone. I prayed with someone who's been to our church and attends another church and they wanted me to pray for them and, and, and I was happy to do that. But uh, my question always is when I pray for people that are attending another church, have you told your pastor? Have you called your pastor for prayer? Because you, you were led not to attend here, you were led to attend there and God's put a shepherd there. You know, because in my mind, I'm like, well, do you want to come here? Do you want, what, where's God want you to be? Where's God sending you? And some people say, oh, it doesn't matter, prayer is prayer, but it does matter. It does matter because if you're not going to a church of prayer, then you're not in the right church. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I asked this lady this question, and she said this. She said, Pastor, the church I go to is not like your church. And she told me what church it is. And it's a church I've been to many, many times. Before and after I walked away from God. I've been to that church many, many times. It's a church that's established in this community. Uh, I don't know when it was first established. But I know of someone who preached there in 1960. It's a Pentecostal church, denominational church. And she said, in our church, they tell you, during the membership class, don't ever pray in tongues in the service because it confuses people. Broke my heart. Broke my heart. When Charity and I were just dating, I took her to this church and this Baptist girl, for the first time ever, heard a tongue, an interpretation of tongues in that church mm. to hear. And their numbers are going up. Their numbers are skyrocketing. But to hear, they've decided that they don't want tongues in their church. It's heartbreaking. Amen. The enemy wants to take the home field advantage even out of the church. Yes. The enemy wants to take the home field advantage out of your home. Mm -hmm. But we gotta contend for the glory. Yes. We gotta contend for the glory. Your home has some advantages. And it might come a day, it might come a time when the kids of your home rebel against those advantages. I did. I had to move out so I could sin better. I did. But you know what? After a few months, I would come back because that's where peace was. Right, yeah. That's where yeah. peace was. Mm -hmm. I'd come back and I'd return. Your home needs that home field advantage. Mm -hmm. Just like a church needs that advantage to contend for the glory, your home needs that advantage. Because this may be your big church, but when you walk inside your door, that's the small church. When you walk inside that home, when you walk inside that living room or that dining room, that's the small auditorium. 
You may not ever get behind the pulpit in this room or in this building, but when you walk into your dining room, when you walk into your living room, you've got a pulpit and you've got a place that you're not only called to speak, you're commanded to speak, and if you don't speak in that place, you're failing. And I, and I do say that in love. I do say that in love. Your home field advantage should include the Word of God. That's right. I, I'll give you my illustration, but I, I pass this back around, and there's some families in this room that could give even better illustrations than I could. But I'll give you my illustration. We have a little girl devotional. We have a Bible story book. And I guess we're kind of old fashioned. We go to the kitchen table in the morning. We wake up at time to do it. We go to the kitchen table and you know, Charity and I are probably trying to throw coffee down our gut. Get ready for the day. <laughs> we go to the kitchen table and we read that little girl devotional. Why? Because there's a little girl there. And then we read the Bible story book that has some good pictures in it. We do that every single morning. Because the home field advantage is the word of God goes forth in that home. Because as of right now, they, they, they're not going to hear that at school. They're not going to right now. And, and, and if they heard it at school, but didn't hear it at home, that means I've failed anyways. God didn't call the state to raise my kids. He called me to. Amen. Amen. I, I, I tell them all the time, you call me. You don't be afraid. I don't care. Call me. Call me. Sometimes they don't want to bug some parents. No, you call me. You call me. Why? Because we're raising her. You know what I'm saying? Principal's not raising her. Teachers aren't raising her. Now, she's going to have a code of conduct and a certain behavior there. But <clears throat> I won't be in the loop. And if you want to be in the loop, you better demand to be in the loop. That's right. Amen. I'm just telling you, if you want to be in the loop, it's got to be a demand. Yes. It's yes. got to be a demand. Yes. Romans 12, verse 2. This needs to be your home field advantage. You know, having a tablet has a lot of advantages. But when you don't charge it, <laughs> you better have some backup notes. <laughs> Amen. Romans 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in other words, it's saying this, without the Word of God, you're going to think and act like the world. Amen. Don't get in pride and think, I don't need my Bible. Don't get in pride and think, you don't need the Word of God in your home. Without the Word of God, you will think and act like the world. Amen. Because it is the Word of God that transforms you. Amen. And, and the word translated transform from the Greek is, is metamorphosu. And we get the word metamorphosis from that. And it is literally the picture of a caterpillar spinning a cocoon and coming out a different species than what it went in to do. The Word of God transforms you just like that. Without the Word of God, you will think and act like the world. With the Word, you'll be transformed. You'll be able to prove good and acceptable and perfect will of God with the Word. Yeah. Without the Word, you're not going to prove the will of God. You're not going to prove the perfection of God's will in your life unless you have the Word of God in your life. Now look at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What's that mean? You're going to stick a page in there and chew it? No. God had a prophet do that, but no, it's not for you. It means you're to speak it. 
You're to speak it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate. And that Hebrew word meditate infers to mutter. And, and you know what muttering is. If you don't know what muttering is, then you never got mad at your spouse, but didn't want them to hear what you were saying. <laughs> if you don't know what the word mutter is, then you never turned around from a parent when you thought they couldn't hear you. <laughs> It's not supposed to come out. It's supposed to always be in your mouth. You're supposed to mutter it. Amen. Muttering, speaking it, is part of meditation. Amen. So well, I don't have a memorized. Put it on a book card. Put it in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Put it in your front pocket. Put it somewhere. Pull it out every now and then. Amen. Amen. Mutter it. Meditate on it. Meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. What I do sometimes in my meditation of the Word of God is I'll look it up on my phone after I plug my phone in and turn it down before I go to sleep. And I'll, I'll put it on the table and, and I'll make myself think about that scripture. I'll think about the meaning of that scripture. I'll think about how that scripture applies to me. And meditation before you go to sleep. You know that uh, they used to teach us when I was in college, especially at university level, he used to say, hey, study before you go to sleep. Because after you go to sleep, you, you're going to rehearse everything that you just got through looking at. Man, wouldn't that be good to read scripture before you go to sleep? You go to sleep and you're still rehearsing it. The spirit man didn't sleep. Your mind can go to sleep. The soulless arena goes to sleep. Your body can go to sleep. But the real you, the spirit man, didn't sleep. That's why, that's why people have the best ideas and the most revelation when they first wake up. Uh -huh. They finally got their mind quiet. Amen. There's been some things I've prayed about. I went to bed, and in the middle of the night I woke up. So, oh, yeah, that's the answer. That's the answer. That's what I need to do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Meditate it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This does not take away from the fact that you need to do something. Right? right? You need to do something. But if you're meditating in the Word, if you're meditating in the Word, you can prosper at what you're doing. Amen. If you're meditating in the Word, you can prosper. You can have good success through the meditation of that Word. How many of you want some good success? How many of you want to prosper? At least half of you do. Hallelujah. <laughs> The other half was born with a silver spoon. That's okay. Amen. Praise God. Bring those offering buckets back out here. I'm just kidding. He's going to get the door. I was afraid of you. Renee knows me. I was just kidding. But prosperity and good success comes with work meditation. If, if you're feeling like you're not having good success at your job, one thing I would do is make sure you're where you need to be. Make sure you're where God called you to be. You say, well, I, I've been praying about that, and I keep going back and forth, and I weigh the pros and the cons, and I'm not sure. Hey, this is, this is good advice I'm about to give you. If you're not sure what God wants you to do next, do what he said last. I just gave you good advice. Go, go with the last thing he told you. Go with the last thing he told you, and stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. And just keep yourself in a position to hear from him again. Amen. Amen. Too many people, times get tough, tribulation comes, and hop right out of the will of God. Hop right out. Well, this is tough. Uh, I'm going, no, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Your business may have the biggest turnover it ever had, and all those rascals may be about to get fired. Hang on. Uh -huh. God knows what's up. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Don't move till he says move. Don't go till he says go. Amen. Stick with it, amen. Amen. But you know, and then the next thing I would check up on is your meditation. What you meditating on? You meditating on the problem or the solution? You know, when I used to, when I was, I had to use it a lot when I was in physics. Y'all ever taken physics? Well, that's a joy. <laughs> physics and then uh, calculus. 
Especially if I was doing like this big old problem where there's like two or three unknowns. Y'all know what an unknown is? No. Yeah, but two or three unknowns. Two or three numbers that you didn't have to plug in. You know, if you have one unknown and you got two knowns, you can plug it into an equation, bada boom, bada bang, right? <laughs> no problem. But you know, you have two or three unknowns, you're like, uh, teacher, there is some information missing here. So I'd be doing something like that, and I'd have to get up and leave it. Uh, I, I, the library, I used to get a private room because they have private rooms. I'd just go into my, also because I had a tobacco habit, and I wanted to put that trash can beside me in that private room so I could spit in the trash can. But I, I would spend hours. <laughs> I, I, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God now. <laughs> and now uh, there's still some things he's working on. That's not one of them, but there's other things. But you know, I'd be in that private room, I spent hours, I'd have to get up and leave it. I, look, I mean, and I could have, it was a big table, but believe me, I could cover the big table. So I'd leave everything in that table and I'd walk outside, go with some fresh air, you know? We, we don't always have a fall day in the fall, but sometimes it's at least not 100. And so I go outside and enjoy some fresh air. And then I'd go back and look at that problem again, and I'd have the answer. And I'd know what to do. Why? Because my mind was gripped up rehearsing the problem over and over and over again. But it, you call it looking at it with fresh eyes. So I go back, look at it fresh, like, oh, I'm going to kick myself for being so dumb. I see it. I see exactly what I have to do right now. But sometimes, if your meditation's on the problem, you're going to stay right in the problem. You're not going to solve it by meditating on the problem. Amen. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Are you here? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, sometimes people can leave and, and their carcass is still sitting right there. <laughs> now, we leave in your carcass. Stay here, stay here, stay with me. But, you know, call a fresh eye. Meditate on the solution. What scripture are you looking at? Right. Meditating in the Word will make your way prosperous, good success. Look at James 1. This is a home field advantage. It's a home field advantage. I told you last week when I first got into algebra, and, and never had the problem yet. But when I first got into algebra back then, we didn't touch it until the eighth or ninth grade. Today, we show it to you in kindergarten. I don't know what's going on, but anyways, <laughs> who am I to tell him? But uh, and but when I first saw it, I was like, oh, this doesn't make sense. I didn't understand this. But my grandmother prayed with me. And man, I became an algebra whiz. Even up there college, you show me an algebra, get it done. I'm going to get done. That's why I was successful in calculus. Algebra was my thing. Home field advantage. Home field advantage. James 1.21, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, okay, with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. It'll make your way prosperous. You'll have good success. All right. James 1.21, the New Living Translation says this, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Now you notice this is talking to you. <laughs> Some people wait on God to get rid of the filth in their life. Oh. And then they're like, well, I guess it's okay to do this because God didn't get rid of it. Well, don't get quiet. <laughs> get rid of all the filth and evil in your life. You do that. You get rid of it. God will help you get rid of it, but you get rid of it. Kick it to the curb. That's right. And humbly accept the word of God. That's good. That's good. You know, there's a difference between pridefully trying to accept the word of God and humbly accepting the word of God. Amen. Humbly accepting the word of God is to say, God, you know, and this is the answer. And no matter what I've thought, no matter what I've practiced, no matter what I've done up until now, I accept the way you say to do it. Was as humbly accepting the word of God. Humbly accepting the word of God. Now, we don't want to talk about your friends, but you've met some friends, you've met some people that do not humbly accept the word of God. You can show them the word of God all of a sudden and say, well, that ain't what I believe.
And you're thinking, you might not be free to say it, but you're thinking, but aren't you a follower of Christ? Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't you love Jesus? Because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. Don't you love Jesus? That's right. What do you mean I didn't want you to believe? This is it right there. <coughs> Amen. Don't shout me down. That's true. So, get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the Word of God. You put the Word of God as priority. You say, if the Bible says it, I believe it, it's settled. Amen. Yes. This is a settlement of any argument. Any argument. It's the Word of God. Any argument. Even things I don't understand yet. Believe it or not, God's been around a lot longer than me. Yes. And when you deal with someone that's been around a lot longer than you, you don't understand the answer. But you really don't even understand the question. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. Job had a lot of questions for, for, for God, didn't he? Yeah, did. Job just thought he just put God on the stand. He's going to, I'm going to prosecute God. I just put God on the stand. And God, instead of just answering Job's little questions, he let him, he, he let him know, Job, you really, you want answers and you don't even understand the question. That's good. You read it. God starts telling Job, where were you? Where were you? Where were you when I, when I told the ocean you can only come this far? Where were you at? Where were you at, Job? Come on now. We think we got the question. We, don't, we, we think we need an answer. We don't really even have the question. Right. Come on. Humbly accept the word of God. Has planted in your heart. For it has the power to save your soul. If that's in your home. That's a home field advantage. Amen. You know, on sports teams, the home field advantage does not mean that that home team will win. Right. If you've been to any of our local football games, you've seen that. <laughs> I'm being facetious. <laughs> if, if your favorite NFL team is my favorite NFL team. <laughs> I could have told him last year it wasn't a coaching issue, but what do I know? The home field advantage doesn't mean you'll win. But the home field advantage means you have an advantage. It means the percentages are higher for you to win. Yes, amen. I guess we've been senior pastors since... Uh, I guess 16 years, 17 years. January would be 15. Okay. So in January it would be 15. It seemed like 16 because it would be 21 in, in 2006 to 21. Whatever. But one thing I've seen is I've seen kids I've seen kids come up through Kingdom Kids. Man, we got awesome teachers. Awesome teachers. Yeah. And, and, um, Ms. Janet has that Kingdom Kids. And I mean, if she's not going to be here and somebody else subs in, you're going to see your lesson plan. You're going to sing what songs you sing. You're going to sing a crap. Everything is just right there. You can be able to jump in and do it because you just got it organized way out ahead. We got an awesome uh, TFC kids department. Uh, they're on rotation, and, and these teachers and the teacher helpers, and they love them kids, and they love all those kids. We have an awesome youth team in place. Amen. You know, we we uh, we don't have a youth pastor, and some people do have a youth pastor, but we have a youth team, and those those team members, they love their kids. But the heartbreaking thing over the years is to see some kids, especially in the youth department, because we got a lot of kids in the youth look around you see that, that they, they don't go to church except you. And then they graduate. And uh, the percentages of not seeing the youth after graduation are really, really high really high. That's a time, you know, getting outside the nest, especially where the enemy really tries to take them down. 
but the percentages of you that stay, not always, but stay in church after they graduate, the percentages are higher when they have parents in church. Amen. Uh, I'm just telling you the way it is. I'm just telling you the way it is. Why? Because it's a home field advantage. It's a home field advantage. A team, their home field advantage is it's their crowd. It's people that love them. It's people that are concerned about them. And it's people that are constantly coaching them. A visiting team, they don't have that. <laughs> They're at odds. They're at odds with the fans. They're at odds with the other sidelines. They're at odds with everybody. You've got to have a home field advantage of the Word of God in your home. When they leave your home, they should be immersed in the Word of God. We, we were helping raise two teenage girls. And we were doing, already doing things for them. But then they came to live with us. We adopted them as our own. When they came to live with us, then we, we had to get them schooled every day. And it was our custom. We had a one-year Bible. And, and it was our custom. I usually drove. We had Charity a shotgun and Jennifer and Sarah in the back. And it was our custom on the way to school. We, we took them out to Great Creek High School because that's where they started. We, left, we kept them there. But it was our custom from our house to school every morning. We read that day's one-year Bible. And we passed it around. Charity read a portion. Sarah read a portion. Jennifer read a portion. And we read that every single day. It's never too late to start putting the Word of God. Amen. It's never too late to put the Word. It's never too late to have, that's my home field advantage. Amen. When we go to camp with the youth, one of the things we do, if you youth have ever told you, is every morning for breakfast, there's devotions. Why? Because our intent is to show them that even when you're eating your Cheerios, you can open the Bible up and read. Huh? Yeah. Amen. Good. There's almost there's only so much of the back of the box you can read anyways. A home field advantage needs to be the word of God. And then a home field advantage with the word of God needs to be when you receive illumination into something. Scriptures really mean something to mom. Scriptures really mean something to dad. You you share it with the whole family. Why do you want to keep that to yourself? Hey, look what God showed me here. Look at this scripture. Man, God showed me that. Share it with them. Well, they think I'm dumb. They probably do anyways. <laughs> Sharing the word isn't going to make you look dumb. Huh? Come on. Wouldn't that be a trick of the enemy anyways? Talk about peer pressure. I don't want you to have peer pressure, but I have peer pressure around the table. So let's not be hypocritical. Right? Let's not be hypocritical. Yeah. Show them. Hey, look what God's showing me in the Word. Yeah. Why? Because this is a home field advantage. This is part of the coaching. It's part of the training. And then they say something or they do something. Oh, hold on, hold on. It says right here you're not supposed to say that. It says right here you're not supposed to do that. Well, I don't want them to shut down. I They'll sh they'll, I'll start to say, they'll shut up too. <laughs> <laughs> shutting down, shutting up, shutting out. Hey, they're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back. You got to show them this up and feel advantage. You, got, you may not have this advantage for long. Making an advantage. When they leave, they will call you and say, Dad, do you got a scripture for this? Mom, you got a scripture for this? Because they get, a, they get accustomed to that whole field advantage. Right. Amen. Let me read you two more scriptures. The Word of God's an advantage. Turn to Deuteronomy 6. The Word of God's an advantage. Should be a home field advantage. <laughs> yeah, you might not hear it out there, but you're going to hear it. 
You, you, you may go to school that's not going to say anything about creation, but in our home, I'm going to read to you about creation. I'm going to tell you about it. And do you realize that in this book, not only does this book contain power, and the power of this book in your mouth is mighty. But not only does this book contain power, do you realize this is the history and the intent of humanity? Do you realize how many people are walking around trying to find themselves and trying to find their purpose? The whole field advantage is we opened this book, which is the intent and purpose of humanity. Contained in this book is why God made you to begin with. Shouldn't that be a whole good advantage? Because other people in the dark, they have no clue. They have no clue. They thought they started out as some amoeba in space. They have no clue. They have no clue what God did. But the whole good advantage is, hey, looky, 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 looky. God made you with the intent of fellowship with you. Amen. God loves you. You were created to be the buddy of God. You, you were created to pal around with God. Amen. Come on. This book has that intent. This is the real history. Amen. This is the history, this is the present, and this is the future. Amen. Amen. And if you don't give that to your kids and to your grandkids and to your family, then they're at a disadvantage, not a, an advantage. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in the heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you should talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. God said, let me give you, these are your opportunities. When you're walking close to your kids, that's an opportunity to start talking to them about me. When you lay down in your home, that's an opportunity for you to start talking to them about me. When you're sitting, that's an opportunity for you to start talking to them about me. It's a home field advantage. Did they do it? Look at Joshua 2. For a little while they did. For a little while. For a little while. They fell asleep. Sleeping giants, the church. I'm hoping, I'm hoping the sleeping giants shaking themselves. There's a shaking going on. Amen. Joshua 2, verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, verse 9. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnach Heres in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gosh. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Huh. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. There's a generation. There's a generation that didn't even see the revivals that took place in the 90s. I, I could go back to they didn't see the charismatic renewal, that they didn't see the Jesus movement, that they didn't see the, the, the word of faith movement, that they didn't see the other moves of God come through the Christian churches. But all we have to do is go back to the 90s and say they didn't see the revivals of the 90s. There's a whole generation that will not know the presence power of God unless we contend for it. Amen. What does that mean unless we fight for it? That's right. Unless we fight for it. Amen. It's okay for a youth group to serve pizza but the most important thing for them to serve is the power and presence of a living God. It's okay for a church to have programs, and it's okay for a church to have uh, a gym class or a dance class or a fishing class or whatever. 
that the church must be a beacon for the power and the presence of God Almighty and must demonstrate the power of God and must demonstrate the move of the Spirit and must flow unapologetically in the gifts of the Spirit that God has put in the church. Amen. There's got to be a home field advantage. There's got to be a home field advantage. Not all churches have a home field advantage. That's why some people leave here and go to where they can have a big concert with lots of lights somewhere else. But when the rubber meets the road, they call me and ask me to pray. And it ought not to be. Amen. There has to be a home field advantage. Your home has to have that advantage to where your kids know mama's going to give me the word. Mama's not going to give me some religious saying. Mama's going to give me the word. Mama's got a scripture for that. Daddy's got a scripture for that. Daddy's going to give me the word. One of the number one sentences in your home needs to be, what does the word say? What does the Bible say? Well, mom, this, well, dad, that. Okay, all right, I understand. What does the Bible say about that? Right, amen. Because that's where the life comes from. Stand with me. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for helping us, putting us in remembrance of your holy written word. God, thank you that you've given us home field adventures. Father, I just been your mouthpiece. It's up to individuals, it's up to leaders in their own home, it's up to parents, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, uncles, aunts. It's up to people whether they'll have this home field advantage or not. I realize that I'm not trying to change anyone. Father, but thank you for bringing oracles today. And we've heard them, and I pray that everybody in this room will be a doer of your way. Thank you, dear God. Everybody, if you don't mind, close your eyes and pray, be in prayer. Think only of your own self for just a minute. If there be anybody in this room, anywhere in the sound of my voice, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, would you do that right now? God is not going to twist your arm, but he's paid the price. God sent Jesus to die for you to rise from the dead. But the choice is yours. You do not have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you want eternal life, you do. If you want eternal life, you must come by the only way, through Jesus. If you want to be born again, you must come through the only way, through Jesus. If you're here and you haven't been saved, or you don't know if you're born again. You know, many people sit in churches everywhere, they just don't know. Have I ever been born again? Did I ever ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life? If you don't know, would you raise your hand? I'll pray with you. If you're watching by Facebook or on the YouTube channel, could you raise your hand? It's most important if God sees it. If you'd be in this room or anywhere watching or hearing, what if you did get saved? You know you did. You had a, I call it a no-so experience. I know I got saved. But what if you wandered outside? What do I mean? What if you left God? He didn't leave you, but you identify with the fact that you walked away from him. You're like the prodigal son who left home, went out and did everything he was told not to do. But today, you want to, I call it this, rededicate your life to the Lord. I had to do that because that was sure me. I walked away from God and I had to rededicate myself back to Him. If that's you and you want to come back home, would you raise your hand? I'm looking to the left. You're right, this congregation, if that's you, would you? Down the middle of this congregation, if that's you, would you raise your hand? 
to my right and your left, if that's you, would you raise your hand? Hallelujah. Would you help me pray for all those who may have a lifted hand watching today? I want to pray two prayers. I want to pray a prayer directed at those who are getting saved for the very first time. If you believe this in your heart and you pray this prayer, you confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. And you need to tell somebody. Call us, 325-949-2534, and even just leave a message. I got saved. I'm saved now. I'm born again. Write to us. Put a comment on Facebook. I just got saved. Tell somebody. Call somebody. Let them know. Pray this prayer. Believe it in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. You're going to pass from darkness into light right now. Everybody in this room loves you. It's going to pray with you. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, believe I believe you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me, cross for me. to save me. save me. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I'm going to serve you in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And now for those that may have wandered off, you do the same thing. Comment, call, tell somebody, I came back, I came back home, I came back to God. You pray this, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, I walked away from you. I walked away from you. I know you wouldn't have left me. I know you wouldn't have left me. But I openly, but I and on purpose, and on purpose. walked away from you. I come back now. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I am back. And I am back to stay. And I am your child. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you came today? I believe God, I think it was two, that maybe three, that four, that did help physically. You know, I guess it was wrong, but the Work Your Healing Center on Thursday was telling a testimony of years ago. Didn't know as much as he knows now back then, but he had some problems in his body and he raised his hand. Two or three men came behind him and started praying for him. He said he felt something start on the top of his head and flow through his entire body. And he walked out of here healed and he walked out of here changed. That's an awesome testimony, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Praise God. Charity and I are going to be at the door for all of you here. We'd love to just shake your hand or give you a hug or bow or whatever you're comfortable with. Maybe some nuggets, whatever you like. <laughs> you can be in charge of that. If you're at home or anywhere else, know also we love you and we're praying for you. And you call us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just give us a minute to get to the door. We'll just miss it.